Hello everybody, my name is David Arismendi and welcome and thank you for joining us in this new adventure, a small talk about everything. In this video series, we will be discussing a piece of literature that explores the human condition and intends to explain how the hero, the hero of our stories, can give us a life we love. For that, we are joined by Eric Riley, who is the author of A Hypothesis of Everything. Eric, thank you for letting us be in your home and thank you for joining us in this new trip. All right, well, thank you, and hi, everybody out there. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you, David. Okay, it's nice to have you here. Eric, uh, first, before we go inside of the book, we would like to know the man behind the book, right? So we are going to focus this new chapter, this chapter one, to know you, to get to know you, to, know, to get to know who you are, what have you done in your life, and what are some of your ideas of your background okay. to, for people to understand who you are and who is talking to them. Perfect. Okay, so would you mind to do a short introduction of yourself? Sure, my name is Eric Riley. I live right now in Medellin, Colombia, and I love it. The weather is amazing, the people are amazing, and well, the cost of living is pretty good too, and that's a big reason I'm here. <laughs> okay, Eric, so let's start with where are you from? Where was I? Where am I from or where was I born? Okay, cool. So what about we talk about your life before Columbia? Okay, well before Columbia, I, what I did was I was a graphic designer in, uh, in, around Houston, Texas. And I also did some other things like um, DJing and actually had a, um, a t-shirt and sign shop in a little tiny town there. Okay, and so what kind of things did you do there? Okay, well, we did um, t-shirt printing, and we made signs and banners. Um, we also designed things for, like, paper products, such as business cards and brochures. Um, let's see, what else? We did, we did graphics for the front of stores. We did vehicle graphics, whatever we could do, because it was a small town, and we had to provide a lot of different services in order just to be competitive. Yeah, right. Whatever yeah. your neighbor might yeah. need. We also actually spent I, – I, we actually – expanded ourselves as a graphic design shop to include publishing a newspaper for about two or three years. So that was a, that was a trick. That was a, a kind of a difficult thing, but it was a lot of fun. So we're, I'm glad we did it just mostly for bragging rights to say that we did it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a cool story to have, actually. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Well, um, that. It was a small newspaper and it was free and it was uh, to it was paid for by advertising. Nothing is free, right? It was paid for by advertising. So we got the local people and local businesses to advertise it. It would come out once a week. It wasn't like a daily because it was a small town, but we just wanted to cover some of the uh, some of the aspects of it. In fact, if you want to see some of the issues of it, you can go to the website ericreilly.com, which is me, and go to um, Go to a section there that has uh, all of the newspaper ones. And if you like reading small town news from a long time ago, uh, that's the place to go. Yeah, for you who are, for those of you who are nostalgic and like to go inside lives of others, that's a pretty, uh, pretty cool material. I've, I've taken a look at that, and it's pretty, uh, pretty sweet to imagine the creation of that, yeah, right? like was, the writing of the content, yeah. looking for stories to tell to the same people that are living those stories. That's yeah. actually pretty cool. In some issues, I actually had to do some editing myself. So if you see some mistakes, sorry, that was, <laughs> that was, that was all me. Yeah, I'm sure the audience yeah. will know how to, how to apologize. Yeah, be forgiving. So thank you. Okay. So um, it seems like you had a story behind the place where you were born. So, where you were born? Yes, I was born in a country called Burundi. And if you don't know where Burundi is, it's in Africa. It's uh, right in the middle. If you put your finger at the top of Egypt, not at the top of, way at the top of Africa, but the top of Egypt to the bottom of South Africa, and put your finger right in the middle, you'll see these two countries right on top of each other. The top one is called Rwanda, mm -hmm. and the bottom is called Burundi. And they used to all be the same continent. I mean, the same country called Rwanda, Urundi. And then the Belgian, the Belgians actually colonized that part of Africa. So they split the two countries, thinking that the Hutu tribe would live in one and the Tutsi tribe would live in another. But there's a lot of war and a lot of problems. And if you've heard of Hotel Rwanda, that's an example of a, of a genocide that happened 
Um, and it wasn't the only one, actually. So there were multiple genocides that happened between those two tribes. And it was very, a very, very sad history. But now they're doing a lot better. So the country on the bottom was called Burundi. And right in the middle of that little country is a mission station called Kibimba. And that's where I was born. It was a Quaker mission station. And my parents were Quaker missionaries out there. Mm, okay, pretty cool. So you mentioned that your parents were Quakers. What is that? Okay, the uh, Quakers is like a denomination, much like Methodist or Baptist. It's a Protestant denomination, uh, very old. Like in the, it started in the, in the mid 1600s, and it grew very fast in England. And it's so old that um, it's had a, it's had a lot of divisions and splits. And because they really um, they hold a high value on personal expression. And it isn't like the Catholic Church where everything is, you know, pretty much set in stone. It's had a lot of a lot of outspurts of, of, of different kinds of. In fact, I was in London in uh, 2004 or five staying at what's called the, the Quaker Missionary House. It's sort of a hostel for people coming in. It's called the Quaker whatever. And the, there was a lady at the desk there that she said that she was a Buddhist Quaker. So I don't know how that fits, but, you know. <laughs> Good for her. And I've had people on a ski lift ask me if uh, they that they've heard that they were actually homosexual Quaker churches. So, um, again, it's a very old denomination and very a lot of a lot of different ways that it's actually grown. My parents are part of the Quaker organization that were more evangelistic because, you know, they were missionaries. So they actually um, expanded, wanted to expand their faith into something that was uh more valuable for for people. Now, do you want to know about Quakers and what they believe? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I was right about to answer right. that. Um, well, the, that's what makes the uh, Quakers most most unique is that they actually had more of um, more social distinctions rather than faith. Um, they also had a very, very deep faith in God, but it is very, very pure. Like God was bigger than the Bible and his words were like could be could be spoken and outside of just the confines of what the Bible was saying that that God was actually an, a, a character that was alive in the, in the world and actually um, active in the world and not dead in some type of just the words of, of, of just the Bible. So, you know, they got in trouble for that a lot in the early times when the Anglican Church was just so rigid about what they believed that, you know, it became it got some problems with that. Hold on one second, guys. We're good. The Anglican Church got pretty rigid about that, making sure that uh, everybody was following, following line, along the lines that they needed to. So actually saying something like, hey, we're not sure if we believe in only the Bible, but that God is actually bigger than the Bible. But the distinctions that they took with them were, were if you say something, you do it. And, well, let's talk about the word Quaker. Quaker was kind of like a, a mocking word, like people would call them, ah, you're just a Quaker. What would happen is they, they believed what they believed so strongly, things like social reform, well, social equality was a big one. They wouldn't tip their hats to the elites, and that got them in a lot of trouble, and they'd actually be sent to prison for things like that. So when they get in the witness stand, they would be so convicted of what they believed that they would, like, tremble, and their faces would shake or whatever. So that's what People that saw them on the witness stand would call them Quakers. And not just because they invented some type of oatmeal. It was uh, <laughs> because they actually were, you know, compelled to, like, move or tremble in, in, uh, in the face of, of confrontation. So people started making fun of them and just called them Quakers. And it stuck. But the real word for the Quakers was called the Society of Friends. And that was basically based on a verse that said that Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And those things about commanding was actually the distinctions of say something and mean it. You know, follow through. Your word is your contract. That's it. Um, everybody's equal from races to levels in the, in the society, genders. Um, everybody's equal. And peace. They were really proponents, like they were activists for pacifism. So... They really were. In fact, the 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 uh, the United States Army had a had a category just for them called conscientious objectors. You could still be in the army, but you'd be have a line called conscientious objecting. 
when sometimes they would put you as a, they'd still put you in the middle of the war, but they'd put you as a medic or some type of other thing that, that wouldn't, you wouldn't have to be holding a gun, killing people. So there was some, there was some, an actual, um, an allowance for the people that had their, those types of convention, convictions. Yeah, I'm pretty sure people in Colombia will understand a lot, um, will fraternize with that idea because yeah. it's, it's actually something new here in the country since it's, you can only be a, a con, con, uh, how did you, how did you say? Uh, oh, consci oh, the conscience is objector, yeah. Oh, okay. The conscience is objection, you yeah. Can, you can only do that here in Colombia since, since uh, 2009. Really? Right, wow, that's right. That's new, okay. So it's, it's pretty new and people will pretty much understand and feel what your, uh, wow. what the society and the community that your parents belong to wow. felt like if they ever had to, maybe yeah. your dad had to, had to serve. Well, I actually, I signed up for the draft when I was 18. Um, I was the only boy in our family of, you know, of, I had multiple sisters, but because I have, the, I was the only boy, maybe that's why they didn't draft me. I don't know, but I didn't get uh, called into the draft, but I was ready. And I had signed that that conscientious objection. So I don't know. I don't know what that would have meant. I may have. I may have still died in war. I don't know. But I wouldn't have been shooting other people while I did it. Oh, hopefully not. Maybe we were lucky. Yeah, we, we were, were just lucky. lucky to yeah. to have you survive. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So Eric, would you cut yourself? Would you call yourself a Quaker? Yeah, I would call myself a Quaker in distinctions in what I believe because I really believe in God with all my heart. I, I've if you're asking me when the last time it was that went to, uh, when I went to church, it, it's a long time ago. Um, but my faith is real, and my 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 spiritual life is very active daily. And if you read any of my book, it has a lot to do with gratitude as an access to speaking the truth and an access to a life you love. So I do gratitude every day, and I find myself inside of that. Um, practice actually thanking God so there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of the spiritual interaction with the like a higher power or a deity that even comes with that but I, I don't know that um, you know Carl Jung who was a psychologist and he mm -hmm. someone asked him if he believed in God and he and he kind of stopped a little bit he goes it isn't that I believe in God it's I know God so when you know something it isn't that you have to believe it anymore. It's like there's a confidence, so just a knowledge of like it's settled, it's peaceful, and it's you know good to go. Mm -hmm. I think you're, that's good. That's pretty nice. Actually, it's good to have a, a system of beliefs that mm -hmm. makes you a better person. Like that's what a lot of people, even uh, people. Well, in my case, I'm not so I'm not too fond of of religion itself as a as a concept, right? But I'm I'm very fond of of being a moral person, being a, having ethics, right? Right. And just as you said, what Quakers stood for, which is keep your word, right? Uh, be fair to others, be rightful. That's yes. uh, mm -hmm. that's actually a something that's quite important. Mm -hmm. And if your faith helps you doing that, I think yeah. that's very positive. That's it doesn't have to be a bad thing, right? Right. And that's why they were my parents were Quaker missionaries in Africa, and that's. What drew them to be that is because they wanted to they wanted to have a world be like that too. And another thing too that Quakers are really big on is simplicity. Like you don't have to have all of these things and all these you know to project yourself as have being a luxurious or a powerful person in, on the planet. You can live real simply and have a fewer things, but also live simply in the way you talk to like tell the speak the truth. And they're really big on that. Like again, your word is your bond. What you said is yes and no. Um, the early Quakers in the United States were persecuted some, but the merchants were really wealthy. And the reason for that is because people really wanted to do business with them because they were consistent and what they said went. Um, in fact, if you've heard of the brand Quaker Oats, and that's mostly how any of us know that there's a Quaker <laughs> out there is, is because of the oatmeal brand. Um, it wasn't, they were an oatmeal company. But they weren't called Quakers at the beginning, but they used the word Quaker. Not, I don't think any of them were Quakers, actually. They used the word Quaker because Quakers were known for quality and consistency. So they adopted the word not because, I mean, I guess if the Quakers wanted to do a class action lawsuit and, <laughs> and say, hey, we want money for using our name, I guess they could, but probably not at this point. 
because they're very old, of course, and they're global. Um, but the Quakers were known for their consistency and their quality for products. And yeah, they became very wealthy. Um, early Americans like William Penn in Pennsylvania, that's what Pennsylvania was named after, was the, is, is uh, William Penn, and he was a very wealthy Quaker. The people that owned the store Macy's in New York were also Quakers, and they were the first ones to create what's the price tag. If you see price tags on anything in the store, Quakers invented them. Really? Is that yeah. so? And what, what for? Well, just for consistency. They, what what happened was people would come in and barter. Like they'd say, oh, this is too much, la da da you know, like you do in every other country in the world, yeah. including Colombia, and, and you try to get the price down a little bit. And then a poor person might come in and they'd be, you'd spend 10 minutes bartering with them. And a rich person might come in and they'd say, well, you know, it's worth my time, so here. So what they did is created a price tag that was fair for the poor and the rich. And they just said, okay, one price. And everybody loved it because something was consistent. Even though it might have been cheaper somewhere else and they might have been able to barter for it a little bit, depending on the mood of the owner, basically. But... They knew that every day they could get this price for this thing. Okay, so you can thank the Quakers next time you go to the supermarket to be to have predictable prices. Yes, that, that's mean, exactly. Have the list, right? Well, it made them it made them rich too, and people who do have price tags do better than the people that don't have price tags. Okay, there you go. A business tip for you guys. So, Eric, uh, tell us a little bit more about your family. Okay. Who are, who is your family? All right. My my dad's name was David. Well, actually, his, yeah, his first name is John, but it went by his middle name, David Riley. And he was um, he was on a team of people that helped uh, build a radio station in Burundi. And he um, it was way back in the in the day, way before internet, way before any of that. In fact, I remember him inventing things like um, taking a manual typewriter and using what's called punch card technology and not you have to actually google that and look that up punch card technology and made a tic-tac-toe computer like a tic-tac-toe game that would play with you and using a manual typewriter of punch card technology so he, he he did things like that with that type of thing because he didn't have you know we didn't have a lot of electronics of course he had the the radio station which he did a lot with but he, um, yeah, that was it was pretty incredible what he would, would they would what these guys would do with absolutely nothing. Um, so there'd be some radio stations in uh, the United States that would have all these broken parts. Well, to get their tax write-off or whatever, they just put them in barrels and send them out to Burundi, and then my dad would have to unpack them and try to and actually fix a lot of things and build some things from actually just scratch. So it was, it was a he was a pretty amazing genius, and I can't say that I got any of that, but I like to invent things, and I'll tell you about some of that a little bit. My mom was an accountant and mostly just raised us kids. Um, I have three older sisters, and the two of them were born in uh, Burundi. One of them was born in the same house I was born in, but of course not at the same time, uh, <laughs> two years before me. And... Um, they're amazing. They taught me how to listen and they were all musical at some level. So me being the youngest, I, you know, took on some music practice and took on, there was a lady out there that taught us piano and we took a lot of piano lessons. And, and, uh, if you see the guitar behind David over there that we oh, have, yeah, I play guitar a little bit. So I hung on to a little bit of the music and, you know, just had some, you know, just music is amazing. It's a fun way to express your life so yeah for yeah see what else about my family i think that's it we we spent the first 10 years about the first 10 years of my life anyway in burundi and then we moved to the state of kansas before i moved to texas out of after college so i spent most of my high school junior high and high school and college years in kansas and uh that was you know just going to school and, and you know whatever it was there but all, a lot of my professional life was in in Texas after that so that was even even better okay uh, okay so thank you Eric uh, we'll have a small pause a short pause for commercial promotion to thank I learn language school for the for sport sponsoring this video series and we'll be right back with you
okay hello again and welcome back we're gonna our next question Eric for you is what has Burundi and being born so far from where you were raised represented to you what does it mean in your life hmm that's a great question um, Burundi I still have a lot of connectedness with Burundi but obviously because I was born there and um, it's a it's it's a country that has experienced a lot of pain um, I actually went back in the early 2000s to see where I was born I know it was I knew it was a house but I didn't remember which one um, and I went back with a, a few times actually between 2001 and 2005 I went uh, I went four times um, and I had a and that's actually in the book too it's in the preface chapter called Burundi and the life of Riley if you want to read some of that you can see um, some of the events that went uh, went with that Burundi Africa at the time was the poorest and when I went back in 2001 was the poorest country second poorest country in the world second only to Sierra Leone and I knew that they were experiencing a lot of tragedy because of the aftermath of the genocides that happened and the problems that were um, happening in both Rwanda and Burundi so I knew that there was going to be some some real struggle especially being labeled as a second poorest country in the world is going to be but you know when I went out there just people were happy they were singing songs they were hugging each other meeting each other on the street with a loud hello and you know big handshakes it was it was just amazing to be at back out there and when I would say that I was born at Kibimba it's a real it's a real source of uh, uh, a real source for them of of how you know because there was a massacre out there and at that mission station and it really caused some problems to the the whole country as far as their guilt their their level of shame was represented in that mission station so when I would say that I was born at Kibimba there was an instant affinity that I would be they would create with me um, being you know a, one of their sons of the country so it was a that's why I still actually talk about it and honestly when you say you're born in a foreign country, there's a there's a lot of juice to that, and I've and I've actually uh, probably arrogantly and um, maybe overconfidently, I've actually used that a lot to distinguish myself from um, some of the other people around me, and not not in necessarily a humble way either. And I got to confess that, um, and it's it's not it's just fun being able to say, yeah, I was born in Burundi, Africa, you know, next to Rwanda just some of the people that I met along the way and again you can read that in the in my in my uh, in my book if you want so some of that is in there too and that's kind of why we're doing this podcast to this this uh, broadcast is to talk about that part of my life and let you know who's talking to you or who's writing to you in the book okay uh, thank you thanks for yeah. for going into that um, Eric how does a kid born in in Africa raised in Texas in the US ends up here in our country why Colombia okay Colombia I, I graphic design is great and then there's economy that happens right now like in this time of we're broadcasting right now is right in the middle of the coronavirus reaction globally is we're all shut inside and now we're I'm we're technically under quarantine I haven't been able to go out in fact today was my shopping day that I could go shopping for groceries which happens only once every four or five days um, so it really makes an impact on my income when all of the stores like my graphics shops that are customers that are my clients that that keep me busy doing graphics out here uh, when they shut down it's just that's you know it's pretty bad well in 2008 a similar thing happened to our economy in the United States where our our economy went really really low for a while and it really impacted my t-shirt and sign shop to the to the extent that I closed it down and I just started doing freelance graphic design so I started looking at other places in the world that I could live in more cheaply than the United States and I looked at Colombia and it just it looked beautiful the people are pleasant they're really nice I came down to visit I uh, went to Bogota for a week to help out at a leadership seminar and the people were just amazing the culture was just really nice but Bogota was a little bit cold for me um, <laughs> and I came to visit Medellin and um, the topography 
it's really weird because the topography of this area of Colombia reminds me so much of Kibimba, actually. And it's in the same time zone as Texas. So how, you know, can't get much better. The weather's amazing. It's so consistent and consistently like those, like that balcony door behind me is usually wide open all day and all night. And I live on the third floor of my building, so there's no, you know, people sneaking in or anything. But it's uh, just nice to be able to have um, amazing weather 24-7, 365 days a year. And it does rain. And then it doesn't rain, and it's just amazing. So, and then the people like uh, like David is are there. It's just a, a beautiful culture um, to be a part of. And again, the beauty of nature is amazing. The whole city of Medellin is just surrounded by and includes a lot of a lot of plants and a lot of uh, a lot of nature. So people really respect nature around here, which I I really adore that too. Yeah. Well, for you, for those of you who are reaching us and joining us today whatever this day may be from anywhere else in the world know that this city is as good as they make it it's true yeah it's come true. visit and come live here we are actually very happy to to welcome people to have people come from all around the world and try to contribute I mean those who contribute yeah right uh, to this culture to grow it I'm a, I'm a strong believer that every culture that has been rich and has flourished uh, throughout history has done it most of the times because of the cultural crush uh, and the cultural crosses uh, erased, but uh, not erased, but that happened after a crisis or mm -hmm. after, as in this case, for example, we are also living, this is 2020. So the, the Venezuelan crisis, mm -hmm. social and economic and humanitarian crisis that it is now, uh, has caused a lot of uh, Venezuelans coming to our country mm -hmm. and people might perceive it as, as something bad and, and this and the humanitarian crisis, I mean, don't get me wrong, but for our culture, it's actually something very positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same that happens in, a, in a, of course, an in individual level or in a community level. But when a foreigner comes into the country and decides to stay, right? Like this is where I want to live now, and this is where I want to to do stuff and to connect with people. This is where I want to create community, right? Yeah, right. And also, as for cultures, where crossing and differences make it grow. For individuals as well, as well, uh, it makes them grow, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. Uh, I hope that you have felt like that. And I actually wanted to ask you if you have felt like you have grown for being in a different culture. Yes, I do. And I actually want to go back to that Venezuela crisis a little bit because the people in around Houston um, can remember 2005, the Katrina hurricane that happened in in, uh, in Louisiana, New Orleans. Then right after that, there were a lot of uh, uh, disaster refugees that came into Houston at such a level that it was like Venezuela taking over Colombia, and just all the people were just showing up, and they're very aggressive with their business. They're out on the streets selling cheaper, and they're doing, you know, they're so it made a big even economic impact on Houston, but also just the society that like these people have nothing, and they're coming in after a disaster. Well, Venezuela just had you know, a, a political, basically political disasters and, and they're coming into the country of, and they're, you know, their whole families are just have nothing and they have no place to stay and they're just, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of big hearted things that are happening by Colombians to really support this, uh, this, this extra influx of humanity and it's just a, so even seeing that has actually caused me to go be a little bit more proud of Colombia, but really what I'm most proud about Colombia is that um, they're like the phoenix that had to rise out of the ashes of the narco traffic, you know, the whole, the whole, the problems of the 80s and the 90s, and they have, they, there's been a, a huge, um, they've had to really, really be strong and buck up and, and to just, and to take, you know, take control of themselves and be honorable in the face of a lot of dishonor, in fact, a lot of international shame that most people know Colombia from the series on Netflix of Narcos. 
and uh, you know yeah. Pablo Escobar and all the movies about that and so there's not much uh, people are just conf you know they conflate it they collapse everything together like this is Colombia and it'll always will be yes there's still probably a lot of uh, you know cocaine trafficking of course from Colombia and Venezuela because the United States is still having a lot of problems with that from here but it doesn't define the country anymore. The, the Colombians took the trauma that came out of that and, and overcame it and used it to be heroic rather than let it just, okay, this is us, we're just going to be this way, so I guess that's the way it's going to be forever. No, that the, the, I think for me in the, in the idea of the hero taking control and, and, and being able to, to define trauma, use trauma to define their victory, that, I feel like that's what Colombia has done. Medellin in particular, because that was the, you know, you've heard of the Medellin cartel and all that kind of thing. Medellin in particular, as the, 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 uh, the city planners have done an amazing job. The metro that runs through Medellin is second to none, and that's probably one of the biggest reasons I'm here too, is this that transportation is so amazing and so effective because they have... And it's quite cheap. Yeah, very cheap. And actually it includes cable cars that go up the mountains too to connect all of the uh, surrounding barrios. And it's, it's just a really uh, an amazing thing. I hope you guys can come out and visit just for the Metro even. And it's award winning. It's actually won several awards in, the, in 2013, I believe, um, with the Wall Street Journal and uh, even globally recognized for being an amazing city of innovation because of their Metro system. So look it up and, and uh, come out and visit. That is right. And yeah. it's actually, well, what you mentioned about the hero for our audience, to know that this is one of the topics that are covered, that is covered in the book, which is how to overcome trauma and to use it for something good, right? To grow out of it instead of live and define yourself by trauma. And um, if I'm getting it right, that's an example of, I mean, in a city level, mm -hmm. of a city identity overcoming trauma and becoming better because of that. Is right. that right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And you see that even on a global level, and I mentioned this in the book as well, during the COVID-19 crisis is that, you know, we're, we're, we're in shock, we're in trauma mode, we're in response mode for everything, but more than ever you see people like ventilators in the, in the United States being made and costing $50,000 a piece. Five year universities in Colombia competing, or not really competing, being called to um, design a ventilator so they've designed one for two thousand dollars it's going to be this that's publicly accepted there's people there's a robotics team um in afghanistan this female robotics team in afghanistan that's taken toyota parts and made ventilators toyota parts and made ventilators for around four hundred dollars each so there's a um, there's i believe a university in um argentina that has a ventilator with 20 with like 20 parts so I mean just what it's done for humanity and also the the people like in Italy singing and and playing music from the balconies to calm down their neighbors I mean that's who we are in times of trauma our first traumatic response is to be heroes and it's just amazing to see it but then I also talk about the fear identity because that comes in right afterwards and wants to complain and wants to point fingers and get political and you see I believe that culturally and society, on a societal level, our fear identity is on full display on our news media of every country. So if you want to look at the complaining and the finger pointing and the victimizing, just turn on the TV and look at your news media and boom, you'll see the fear identity as opposed to the hero that's doing a great things. You don't hear about too much about them anymore. You have to really look. Yeah. But all the bad things, yeah, it's, it's all over the place. So that's you know that's part of the the hero, the hero core and the and the us being amazing like we're you know like it's in us it's in all of us you just got to do it. Yeah, may it be a call for our audience to be heroes in this in these times where a lot of people is in need of not only economically uh, of course but in need of having a friend in need of be reminded that we will go over it right we will get over it and we will most likely survive this thing and as a society of course we will survive it but right now it might seem very dark and and because of that also thank you again for for being here with us because this is part of that this is part of of using the hero and creating things out of 
the crisis, right? Yeah, exactly. Like putting this program together and bringing you this and you being part of, of it, uh, listening to us and following through this video is part of being heroes, right? Of doing something. If not, I mean, even if it's just uh, remaining sane, right? That's right. That's exactly it. I want to say a little bit more about Columbia too. Being here in Columbia has also given me the space, of course, um, to be creative, like to write this book and to do, um, you know, more graphics that I want to do. It's also given me space to think about inventing, inventing things too. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been thinking about this uh, audio cable that could uh, use and actually exploit the features of every channel that comes out of your your audio out signal of your laptop or your of your cell phone. You got your left channel, right channel, and you got your microphone channel. So it's uh, being able to use all those channels inside of being a mobile DJ that um, not only lets you play out to public speakers, but also has uses one of the channels to actually use for your headphones, which is normal. A lot of the uh, even they even have cables for it too, but to also expand to actually be able to use a one cable for your output, for your headphones, and for your microphone. So that's, uh, that's what I'm working on right now, and I've actually designed prototypes for that. You can see that on my website. Um, I don't think people are going to be having parties very soon and needing DJs, but uh, what I'm also working on is, uh, is an, uh, a connection to go between LED light strips to create shapes of LED lights to be like soft boxes, like you see, like you see those LED rings for even lighting. I'm actually using one of the, one of the things I sort of did, just the just to be able to connect those things together and to be able to put them on mic stands. So I know that a lot of people are going to be doing, you know, doing podcasts or doing their little Instagram videos or whatever, just need a, need better lighting and they need to have it in multiple colors. Uh, we're going to be able to, I'm, what I'm inventing is actually going to be able to provide for that too. So that's in the early stages. I have a friend of mine who's got a 3D printer and he's, we've been working at the, as conceptually on making it work. So we're, tossing back ideas back and forth and uh, we'll get we'll get something out to you to be able to see hopefully on my website too uh, about that invention because I'd really like to make some money on that by the way my book is free and it'll always be free so that's um, I'm not making any money on that so if you but I have a place on my website and also on the Facebook to see the different apps that uh, donations and the way that ways that I can get tipped or get some don't you know contribution for whatever if, if it's making a difference for you great if it's not i understand and and uh still tell your friends that it's not making a difference and tell a lot of your friends that it's not making a difference and let them see for themselves <laughs> so yeah thanks yeah i mean the more people that join us in this conversation in this big conversation which is the book right right it's it's something that you're writing as an author but it is truly it is a conversation with this culture and the culture of the war of of that part of our global culture of being depressed, right? Mm -hmm. And being sad and and shutting up our heroes uh, to give in to the fear protein, right? Which is a concept that you will know better in the, in the book. But that is uh, remarkable. I think it's, it's very remarkable to have a mind at work mm -hmm. doing stuff to keep alive yeah. your business it's while fun. creating something that's meaningful. And well, in the name of our audience, uh, I want to thank you for that. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I've, I've, I mean, I mean I've been part of this ride with Eric uh, of, of having conversations around the book before it actually it's written and then write and uh, reading it yeah. or discussing I've been discussing it with you for years too yeah. and having glimpses at what right now is happening as a book right so it's and I want to say that David, that David doesn't think like me and that's actually the best part about this whole thing is that we get to dialogue and he gets to disagree with me hmm. and I I talked to him mostly to get the disagreement so to, to refine this to get it how does this fit into the today's culture without being overly spiritual about it or being religious about it you know how does it actually apply so guys like david has been just so valuable in and uh, be, be, being that sounding board and the and the bonus about david is he is a professional translator so he is actually 
the one taking the words in English and translating them into Spanish right now. He also can do that for French. If you have any French documents that you need translated into Spanish, a little bit of a plug for him on that too. <laughs> so just know that, that in the future, if you see the words of the, and if, you know, if you see some concepts that are in Spanish that are really wake you up, it's because um, David's been applying um, more heart to it than just what the, you know, what like literal translations are. So, um, you can that you know he's the he's the go-to guy for that. So I just put putting that plug in as well. Well, uh, thanks for the yeah. short promo. I my, appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Eric. Um, how about we talk about the people? We okay. already talked about the country and where you were born and how it impacted you, right? right? But let's talk about the people that has that have had an impact in your life, right? And who of those people wow. might be here in Colombia? <laughs> okay, well, there's a, you know, there's a, a big long list of people in my life because I'm old. I'm 57 years old actually, and that there's so after that many years, you get like a thousand people that have really been amazing and impactful in my life. But I, I want to probably bring it closer down to my, you know, my, my immediate family. Of course, has been so supportive um, and a great sounding board for some of the principles and stuff that I want to describe in my book, as well as clarifying some of the things that happened in the past. Like even in Burundi, when I was a kid, there's so much that I don't remember that, you know, my sisters have to say, well, Eric, that's not exactly the way it went, or yeah, it was actually this way, and, and um, by the way, you can add this as well. So they've been very impactful for that. Um, the people here in Colombia that have been amazing to me is just a, a lot of group. In fact, I've expanded, my network includes more Colombians than more gringos that are here I, I, I meet a few gringos and i don't know if you're one of them listening but there's a depression follows us all around the world and that the that's that, true that there's i've been i've been gifted with um with making the acquaintance of of several people here that have, have really um have had to deal with depression and some of them not even noticing or not even be able to identify it as depression but others really have knowing that they deal with that on a chronic level, on a really deep level where they can't even get out of bed. They're just um, they're just pressed pressed down in their beds by anxiety every day, every day, every day. And it's a uh, so this book is sort of a little bit of a response to that. And and um, and I I want to yeah you know, I'd love to make a difference in that. I'd love for this book to actually um, be able to wake some people up and not only just be able to possibly bring some light at the end of the tunnel for some of my friends that are depressed or that that are ridden with anxiety but also the people that aren't ridden with that don't have any idea what depression is i don't i've never really experienced it myself but i've seen it so much around me that it's been a gift for me to actually see it and i want them to be like alert to um, the, the possibility of making a difference in the lives of your friends even if it's just say, you know, I don't even care that peop that you use credit my book at all. But if you see something in here that you can use for yourself to make more of a difference in your community, use it. I don't care. I mean, it's not it's a free book anyway. It isn't like I'm going to be losing money if you take take my principles out of it. I don't, really don't care. But just use it. Just do do something to make a difference for yourself and 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 your and your community and your family. Because uh, that's some, really the most important thing. Because it's on the level of individual that our world can actually move into some other place uh, that's better yeah and I'm sure every one of you will find will be able to find something that you can impact your own community with because uh, we all are deep we're all different and we all live uh, we all go through our different struggles and we all have our demons as some people say mm -hmm. right and but the book is very wide on how to approach those things and it's it talks to a very uh, to our very core as humans which is I mean it's it's my opinion that it's it's a uh, it's a message that goes very deep and that as uh, in doing so it allows every one of us to find something meaningful to it right whether it's a concept whether it is one full chapter of the book or the whole thing I don't know. Maybe it's, your, it's the preface. Maybe maybe you will find something to impact your community and the, in the life of Riley, mm -hmm. right? Right. That might be it. So I encourage you to actually go 
looking for things that are worth sharing with others. Exactly, right. And as far as people go, there's there's David. There's, you know, having having him in my life and actually seeing him take on life from a different point of view, um, philosophically and maybe spiritually, but yet being someone who is so committed to integrity and so into, and committed to um, the health of humanity on with a different type of level of or different. Uh, perspective than me has just been has been brilliant. So I've, you know, thank you, David, for for being that kind of an impact on my life. Um, friends of mine that have connected that David and I were actually connected me with a lot of other people. That's uh, her name is Danny, and I, she lives in Texas now. So we sort of traded places, and but she actually um, and I don't remember. Oh, I met her on a Metro Cable because she was curious in learning English, and me you know, someone else was here to do some seminars from the United States and she was across from the, on the Metro Cable and she just wanted to know what we were talking about if she could practice her English with us and then then she connected me with uh, several people just like David so it's been it's you know how the miracles sort of happen and it's just weird it's just very 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 interesting how life turns out when you when you quit saying no and start saying okay let's look at this and have a little bit of fun or a little bit of adventure with life yeah writing stories is uh, it's a mm -hmm. way of living a happy life yeah. like me up being open to to write those stories and to create stories for other people so yeah i also thank thank danny a lot because she is the she is the reason why this program is happening right now actually so if you're if you're watching this danny thank you very much i think i hope you're you're being very happy there in texas yeah um, Eric, I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit more about you as an author, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> let's start with the, with the name of the book, right? So okay. the book is called A Hypothesis of Everything, which I understand is a wordplay with The Theory of Everything by Stephen Hawking. Is yes, that right? Right, right. Okay, so why a hypothesis? Why not theory? Okay, well, th well, theory of everything is already taken for one, but a theory is... is well, it isn't proven, but it's it's closer to being proven than a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a, is a hunch. It's like, okay, here's an idea. Let's have a hypothesis to move it into the category of theory to actually be an axiom or a fact or, you know, a law in down the, down the road. So, yeah, I don't think we're even at theory yet, but there's some things that have worked well in my life. So I'm, at, I'm still just at the hypothesis level. And it's not the hypothesis. Notice that it's a hypothesis. It's my hypothesis. So one out of 150 billion people, no, not billion, but just hundreds of millions of people that have ideas, this is just one of them. So there might be more people than that that have ideas, but yeah, that's that's part of the encouragement too, is just have an original thought. Don't just launch out and, and grab hold of something that might be original or might not be, because there isn't much on this planet that is original anymore. Um, that's actually in the Bible too, and most the uh, most philosophers is just really there's nothing new in the world. Well, you don't know that, so take on something that you don't know, and and t test it out and check it out as maybe something that you can apply in your life. And that's kind of what I've done with several different things inside of this book. So, but it's all just a hypothesis. It's just an exploration of who we can be as humans that might be better than who we were before. Um, and also, I'm not going to you know sugarcoat it. Most of my books, most of my chapters, show our really dark side and why we don't why we don't do that. Why we don't we do gratitude? The gratitude chapter is probably more about why we don't do gratitude <laughs> than why we do gratitude. So or, or what the importance of gratitude is. So uh, I really want to explore that part of our life too. Is what keeps us from from <laughs> from having the life we love, and even that first chapter about the fear identity, and we'll talk about this next time too, is that, you know, I spend more time talking about your fear identity than I do talking about your hero core, because that's where we live. We live inside of this whole thing called, I'm afraid. I don't know how to do it right, and I'm consumed with doing it right, because that's all there is in the world, is looking good or avoiding looking bad. So, um, we, yeah, we talk about that a lot. And, I, and I'd love to get ideas about where you are with things, too, in the comments section or just want to email me. I'm sure that we'll have one posted. So, 
or just go to my site and leave it you, down at the bottom of the page. You can email me from there too at ericreilly.com. Yeah, well, um, take the title, you guys, as an invitation or as a teasing even to tell us your own hypothesis of everything, right? This is exactly. one of them, but we would love to read what's your hypothesis of everything or your hypothesis of something, right? Yeah. Yeah. We may we might not have the, the possibility or the or the energy maybe some of us to write the whole thing right but if you could uh, write to us and share with us uh, your hypothesis of gratitude or your hypothesis of the hero or your hypothesis on how to live a grateful life uh, or how to avoid uh, responding to the fear protein we would love to to read that those things um, Eric where do these ideas come from in your life? Okay, well these ideas come from um, somewhere very important. It's called my imagination. So don't don't discount your imagination as being a, 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 a powerful resource for you and what you think about. Because music comes from imagine, your imagination. Beautiful things, all created, all the creativity you do come from your imagination. So don't discount your imagination from from coming up with ideas or thoughts that, that could be important for people to know or understand. Um, it comes from a lot of, uh, I'm not, you know, I have a, uh, I have a certain education, but it's not an education in philosophy or psychology, but I've, I've been alive long enough to meet a lot of people that have a particular set of responses to, um, to trauma, to life, to, to good things in their life and bad things in their life and, and to good people in their life and bad people in life and some very, very bad things in, in life that happen to them. So I, I see a consistency in some of the ways we respond and the, some of the ways we separate ourselves from, from the things we believe in the most and the things we love the most, our family, the people that are ideals, the, 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 the things that are very important for us and the way we take ourselves away from it. And we, we take ourselves away from that all the time pointing at them saying that we're the victim of you and blaming other people for our own separation. So I see that inside of humanity a lot and that's that's uh, that's really the source of, of a lot of these principles in the book. Plus the gifts of meeting um, people who are depressed and have a lot of anxiety. And I think that's been the biggest source of, uh, biggest resource for me is, is those people's lives and um, actually speak into that at some level at, in, at, at the little way that I know and that I can understand and that's why you know that's why I'm open to any up any conversation about this okay yeah that's very valuable it comes from your experience but a very particular point of your experience which is the uh, feeling of of perceiving others right and their fear and their in their struggle, right? And how that talks to themselves, how they talk to themselves when they are at that point. And of course, how you talk to yourself when you're at fear, right? Because we are, at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all go through these feelings, yeah. right? So, okay. Uh, guys, uh, this is gonna be another commercial pause. So we'll be back with you in a couple of seconds. Thank you very much. Queremos agradecerle a nuestro patrocinador, I Learn Language School, por apoyar este proyecto y por patrocinarnos en esta aventura de hacer el Small Talk About Everything. El I Learn Language School es una escuela de idiomas ubicada en Sabaneta, en el municipio de Sabaneta, en el parque comercial Aves María, local 115. En este momento de, de la crisis del coronavirus, estamos ofreciendo cursos virtuales, están las matrículas abiertas para todos los que quieran tomar cursos de inglés y de francés desde la comodidad de sus casas. Eh, yo soy uno de los profesores que colabora en la escuela, pero tenemos una opción muy amplia de profesores y de niveles con los que cada uno puede comprometerse y donde cada quien puede encontrar eh, lo que necesite, lo que está buscando. Es una buena forma de aprovechar el tiempo que tenemos en este momento de la, de la cuarentena para crecer eh, académicamente, ¿cierto? La, 
idea de aprender idiomas es algo que ronda en la mente de todos, sobre todo acá en Medellín, las personas usualmente están en búsqueda de eso y el Learn Language School es, un, es una muy buena opción, yo como colaborador me he sentido muy feliz trabajando con ellos, es, puedo dar fe de que es, eh, tienen un gran sentido de la integridad y de compromiso con sus estudiantes y realmente recomendamos que los sigan, busquen información sobre ellos, pueden encontrarlos en Facebook y en Instagram como arroba I Learn Language School y pueden también escribir para pedir información en los números en el número 300 783 47 15 300 783 47 15 al WhatsApp solicitar información de precios de disponibilidad de horarios y encontrar algo que funcione para cada uno de ustedes muchas gracias a nuestros patrocinadores And we're back, we're gonna go back with Eric to uh, wrap our first episode up. Okay, Eric. So next question is, what's your goal with this book? What do you want to achieve writing it? Okay, what I want to achieve writing a hypothesis of everything is mostly to, well, it has a part to prove to myself of completing uh, this book, because this is actually the first book I've ever written. So, and, and it's going to be a substantial book by the end of it, and we're doing it one chapter at a time, putting it up online, and, and then two weeks later, usually it's in, in the, the chapters in Spanish as well. So, and then I'm doing a lots of little, like, posters or little quotes and that thing, those types of things in between times as well. What I want to accomplish is that you discover who you are as actually as, as your core hero, and that you identify that in such a way where you're really making a difference not only in your life but the lives of people around you and that you find uh, meaning in the way that you are responsible in your life and the way you take on different things that your life becomes happier and more content not just like happy you know that come on drugs or whatever but happy as in you're confident you're content daily and you wake up with a with a feeling of wow of hope a of purpose of i want to do this day i want to make it right i want to make it fun I want to meet people that, and have fun in their lives and, and create fun for them as well. So that's my um, goal for this. That's very nice. Okay. And how can people <clears throat> access the book? People can access the book uh, various ways. They can go to ericreilly.com and I keep uploading the new chapters. I actually have um, some of the original chapters that I've written already um, in in the months past or even in 2019 on there already and they're in audio form as well you can go to my youtube channel which is in under eric fly 99 or look up a hypothesis of everything and um if you look up that in your spotify podcast cast box i'm also uh, putting up putting up the uh, podcast the audio podcast so this is also an audio book It is an audiobook, yep, and it's going to be an audiobook in Spanish as well, as you already know. Yeah, okay, so ericreilly.com is where you can find the, the chapters, the written version of it, and the future when the book, this is a work in progress. Yes. But uh, you will be able to go with us in the process of writing and creating it. You can follow every chapter as it happens, and as Eric said, it will be also translating into Spanish for you. Right. I have a Facebook page, a hypothesis, um, Facebook, a hypothesis of everything. And in Spanish, I think it's going to be una hipótesis del todo. Um, That's right. And, and, uh, on, on Facebook as well. So we're going to have one page that's fully in English, and then we're going to have another page that's just going to be the Spanish version. So you can find us on Facebook as well. Perfect. Okay, Eric, tell us how can people support the Hypothesis of Everything project? Okay, um, I have several um, finance apps that you can, if you're not, if you're like in, this, in the States or if you have a USA bank account, you can contribute, but I also have on my page, on my support page on ericreilly.com, my Bank Colombia savings account number if you want to uh, tip me. Um, it doesn't have to be substantial either, just anything that helps you feel like you've helped me, which 
is all up to you. It's not not a requirement. I'm not selling this book for a particular price, but if there's some value that you have for yourself and that you want to contribute back to me, I uh, this is my livelihood right now because of you know the different the disaster has caused my graphic design um, business to not be very you know not not be very much business right now so this is my livelihood and I would I would really appreciate any support you want to give me on that so it's uh, actually on the support page and if you go to my Facebook page all of those little links um, are ways to tip me is um, actually in the title bar of, of my Facebook pages as well so um, just go to those Mm -hmm. Remember that you can also support the project by sharing it with your friends, sharing it with your family, uh, creating the conversation around this book is a huge way of supporting it if you can't, uh, if you're not in the possibility of, of supporting it financially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So think of that if you want to help this happen and to keep this going, you can contribute to it by social media I mean through social media right yeah, Instagram as well um, Eric Riley dot com with a D O T C O M Eric Riley dot com all spelled out no point com dot com Eric Riley dot com is my Instagram and I actually I actually upload the chapters in video form um, in the amounts of time that Instagram lets you it's up to like I think they let you do up to 10 minutes each time in my pot my chapters are more like 15 minutes so I break them in half and I put them up there um, and a little bit of maybe some um, quotes and things but I also like to take video of different types of people street musicians and things here in, in Colombia so you'll see some of that as well um, just enjoy that if you want to follow me at ericreilly.com on Instagram okay so uh, we already made clear that the book it's going to be in English originally, right? Because Eric is a native speaker of English, but it's going to be also in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. Both the written version of it and the audiobook in the future. And your social media, again, please, if you can, uh, remind our audience of how to find you. Okay. Instagram, ericreilly.com. Facebook, a hypothesis of everything or only hipótesis del todo. Want to say that real quick for me? Uh, una hipótesis del todo. Yeah, that. So it's going to be um, both for that and my uh, in social media by my website ericreilly.com dot com is uh, is there as well and you can see all that. I do have a Twitter, but I really don't want to take advantage of my Twitter yet because I feel like Twitter is all about complaining about things and being being like hysterical and I don't <laughs> want to be hysterical. I really want to create something really solid. But I I will I will get brave enough in the future to actually. Um, handle or manage Twitter in a way that's uh, responsible and not and not so reactive. But right now, it just feels like a reactive platform, which it mostly is. <laughs> right. It truly is. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big user of Twitter, and it truly is <laughs> a lot of complaining, a lot of people screaming at each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you will have the links to all of these platforms and the description of this video down below. So feel free to go there and click them and explore what you can find, what suits you better, right? If you're an Instagram user, then you will find a way to engage with the content. If you're a Facebook user, you will have a way, either you speak Spanish or English, you will find something where you can um, explore the book, right? And Spotify, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. Spotify will also be in, uh, in the description. You can find all of these links below and the book right uh for you guys right. this is a regular publication that is intended to be every week with a new chapter this last chapter has actually taken me a few extra days to write almost an extra week to write um and some things might be like that but we're going to announce to you when we're going to be on next with uh and actually maybe when a, a new chapter shows up so the intention is that every weekend i have a new chapter to show you that is in english and hopefully even in the video audio form uh, the audio form definitely but hopefully we'll have a little cool little video presentation to give to you as well with that because that's the intention is that i get a chapter done every week until this thing is done I'm intending to, I'm, my intention is that it will probably be a 10 or 11 chapters total. Um, and right now I have that sort of planned out, but who knows, it might be even more. So 
thank you and keep you know keep joining us here on this talk show because we're going to be taking on a chapter almost every week okay uh, to the people who has who have joined us in this new adventure thank you very much for getting this far and we hope you can join us next week no not next week but next time uh, next chapter is going to be on May 3rd and we will be discussing chapter 1 of A Hypothesis of Everything which, Eric? Is, a, which is available right now in English and Spanish so mm -hmm. uh, the written form anyway the, the video and audio is, is available in English so you can listen to that it, but if you choose just to want to read the uh, Spanish version of it it's available so go to ericreilly.com or um, yeah ericreilly.com is where it's at in written form right now so you can you can go to that and there'll be other we'll tell you other formats later that you can see or hear that Eric um, and, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time for being with us today and thanks to all of you, yes, thank you for joining us in the adventure right thank you guys appreciate you and we'll so we'll see you next time so we're gonna sign out now see you next time bye bye